Okay, uh, hello everyone. Uh, Eric Usher here again. Uh, apologies for the, the short delay, but uh, we're up and running now. Uh, welcome, um, and uh, thank you for joining uh, this update session. Uh, we have quite a bit of material to, to get through, so uh, apologies for many slides um, and a uh, number of speakers. Uh, but I think through this, it'll give you a great overview of the types of things that are going on and maybe some opportunities for joining new activities. Uh, I am joined today by Olivia Fabry, who's Program Manager for the Principal Sustainable Insurance. She's going to give an overview of um, uh, some of the PSI work. And then we will also have uh, James Wallace from Allianz Germany, who will talk about uh, the ESG standard and underwriting that's being developed. Um, before that, I'm going to give an overview on the banking work, and we also have Jan Kermode from UBS, who's specifically going to talk about the work um, in implementation of the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures, the banking group there. Um, so if I could uh, move to the next slide, let's get started. Uh, we do have a chat box on the webinar. Uh, we're, as I said, we're time-pressed. If there are any pressing issues, please do send us your, your questions or comments, and um, if we have time, we will get to them. I hope we can. If by chance we don't have time, we will follow up after the webinar. Uh, okay, so let's talk first about uh, banking and a uh, number of activities um, I'll cover, and then I will pass it over to, to Jan. Um, the first one is an update on the work on a positive impact finance. So as many of you will be aware, we launched the Principles for Positive Impact Finance in Paris in January of this year. Um, and essentially, it's a, you know, a basis for providing some form of, uh, essentially enhanced form of extra financial analysis, which holistically encompasses both the positive and negative impacts across the pillars of sustainable development. Um, the, these, the four principles relate to definition, frameworks, transparency, and assessment. Um, and the uh, a strategy for implementation, which was agreed amongst the working group in April, has established four working groups, three of them which are focused on the principles themselves and the development of uh, PI, so positive impact compliant products and services. Just a quick um, intro to these working groups. So the working group one on frameworks is looking at essentially how you can embed positive impact analysis within your existing procedures and frameworks. And it, it will, the analysis will take some different shapes depending on the financial product or service and the underlying counterparty or asset being looked at. And you see a table here which shows some of the different underlying, um, so counterparties, projects, physical assets versus the types of financial products, including some of the frameworks that are out there, for instance, the Green Bond Principles, the Equator Principles, Gresby for, for real estate. So in an initial work, this working group will re review these existing frameworks or standards, perform a sort of gap analysis, and how it fits to the requirements of the PI principles and issue guidance and recommendations on what is needed to essentially to fill in gaps in, in complying with the approach. Um, not all categories are going to be covered right away. Uh, but over time, we hope that a, a matrix of, of guidance documents will come out covering um, at least the major areas of interest to, to the members. Working group two is on impact categories and indicators and examining how or what impact categories to use to identify positive, uh, potential positive impacts in the market and inside portfolios, how to monitor, measure, and report on these impacts. Guidance notes will come out seeking to translate macro objectives, for instance, the achievement of the sustainable development goals down to a manageable set of indicators at the micro level for use within the PI frameworks. Working group three is on assessment and we'll look at what qualifies as positive impact products or services. How can these products services be verified? Can they be certified? How can they be rated based on their degree of impact and who, who should be playing those roles? Guidance notes there will be developed per product type based on the different types of assessments that can be applied including assessment of the quality of the products and services in terms of impacts achieved. Um, how to become involved. Um, if you're interested in working on the development of these guidance notes it, within a uh, particular category of products or um, underlying counterparty, uh, you can join the initiative at no extra cost uh, and become involved. 
um, in one or a couple of the working groups. Uh, members who are interested but are unable to, to, to um, uh, commit time to a working group can also receive, obviously, the, the outputs from this work. So you'll be getting this draft guidance uh, over time. The first guidance notes are scheduled for release in uh, later this year. Next slide, please. Another aspect of uh, the positive impact work um, is a grounding paper or a position paper which basically is looking to provide a clearer picture of the current financial flows, both public and private, and their potential to meet uh, sustainable development goal investment needs. Um, it, it's going to look to clarify essentially the nature and proportion of the funding gap um, and what can be provided already or delivered by the private financial sector today and, and what barriers prevent uh, private finance to play a larger role. It'll then make a series of recommendations um, for the finance sector and for its, its private and public clients in terms of how to address some of these barriers. Um, some of the preliminary findings, well, unsurprisingly, there are significant data gaps. Um, a lot of the emphasis is looking at how can better tagging be used at all levels along the value chain to help identify and drive SDG-related business. Uh, at a more fundamental level, the, the absence of business models around many of the impacts needs to be better understood to see exactly how and what role for public actors and the private sector to try to come up to new approaches to, to delivering the financing needed. Um, so that, those are the preliminary findings. This, this paper is being prepared in partnership with the World Business Council on Sustainable Development, who, who groups together largely on the, on the corporate, so that the, the users of such finance side, their perspective, um, combined with the FI um, members on the supply side. Um, it's also uh, PwC, PricewaterhouseCoopers, is, has been retained to, to help in developing the document. Um, in terms of recommendations, it's going to come out and essentially say that FIs need to start applying a more holistic framework um, to assessment vis-a-vis -vis with their clients and with their investing companies. Um, positive impact specialization or specialists will increasingly be needed within financial institutions to be engaging with and serving clients um, on the resolution of specific types of, of sustainable development needs and, and responses. Um, and that further research definitely will need to be done to fill some of the, the data gaps. Uh, the timing, uh, once again, it will be released in the fall. We don't have an exact date yet, but news on that will be coming quite shortly. Next slide, please. So um, if we start to, to jump into some of the specific areas related to positive impact finance, uh, energy efficiency financing certainly springs to mind. And this is an area where we have been working with a, a grouping of our members for quite some time. Um, this is including setting up two different task groups, one at the G20 level and one at the European level, the European one in partnership with the European Commission. Um, to provide a better understanding of what's happening today, but also to make recommendations both to policymakers, but also to commercial actors. Um, two big outputs have come out quite recently. The G20 Energy Efficiency Investment Toolkit, which provides an assessment of current energy efficiency investment by sector and region. Interestingly, uh, there's about $220 billion of, of investment in energy efficiency uh, last year. It's actually not that much less than renewables investment, but it's definitely much less well understood. So we in for providing increased focus about what that means to be financing efficiency, where the investment opportunities are, um, as well as financing, insurance, et cetera. Um, the, the, the toolkit also provides a showcase of national policy frameworks, and that's targeting specifically G20 governments and some best-in-class analysis of instruments, essentially looking um, at banking, um, investment, and insurance. Meanwhile, uh, just last week in Brussels, we launched uh, with uh, the European Commission Vice President, Maro Sefcovic, um, the EFIG Underwriting Toolkit. The EFIG is the Energy Efficiency Financial Institutions Group, which is this working group that we've been doing with the Commission. And as Essentially, this is a value and risk appraisal guide for better understanding um, uh, the opportunities and essentially the types of products and services and instruments which are being used to provide 
uh, financing to the sector. There's a, a profile, a number of um, uh, very interesting in instruments. Many of them members of FFI, what they're doing within the European context. Um, the both of this information is on the website, uh, and uh, you see on the slides where this online version of the, the European toolkit can be downloaded from. Next slide. Okay, we're going to shift to talk about um, work related to ecosystems and natural capital. And this is uh, one of our very high profile projects, um, which is the stress tasting of loan portfolios for drought scenarios. And this is work undertaken by the Natural Capital Finance Alliance. This NTFA alliance um, uh, uh, previously was called the Natural Capital Declaration. It changed its name uh, this past year, but it is a partnership of our members um, being co-managed by UNIFFI and the Global Canopy Program. And uh, this project specifically has been done with GIZ and with the support of the German Federal Ministry of Economic Cooperation and Development, BMZ. Uh, specifically, uh, the work um, involved engaging with RMS, which is a risk management solutions. It's a, um, a, a global catastrophe modeling firm, which would be familiar to many of our insurance members, but maybe less so on the banking side. And working with them and a group of leading academics um, and the input of nine banks, this basically it's developed an open source tool to help equip banks to understand their clients and portfolio vulnerability to extreme drought scenarios. Uh, the tool uses five drought scenarios. Um, for four countries, Brazil, China, Mexico, and the U.S., to model the potential impact of drought on 19 different industry sectors, the companies in those sectors, and the likelihood they will default on their loans. Some of the key takeaways, and you'll, you'll find this information um, uh, online on the website, but some of the, the information is um, essentially uncovering drought as, as a previously untreated risk within portfolio, uh, financial portfolios. Um, and some of the, the takeaways being, for instance, that geographical concentration has a larger impact on, um, on um, uh, stresses than sector concentration. The reason being that uh, first order impacts on water intensive industries um, are maybe better understood, but what is less well understood is the impact on the wider economy. And therefore, geographic concentration in a specific country or region can and provide um, uh, specific types of stresses on the portfolio that go far beyond the very narrow lens of just looking at the water intensive industry. Um, so we're, we're essentially the, the, the work is the first time we've looked in depth into this notion of disparate sectors and how they share dependence on water availability and how this dependence can make portfolios less diversified than they initially appear. Next slide, please. This, uh, the, the NCFA, National Capital Finance Alliance, is now undertaking um, an, an advanced environmental risk management project. Um, and at the top of this slide, um, you see a definition of natural capital risk being the risk of reduction in the benefits that humans in their economy receive from nature as a result of human pressures on the alignment, on the environment, excuse me. So what this project essentially does in its first order is to look at how does natural capital uh, risk affect businesses, essentially where are the dependencies and um, how do dependencies uh, mean risks uh, across portfolios. And then in the second instance, how can FIs integrate natural capital risk into their assessments? Uh, the project will come out with two outputs uh, later this year, uh, as output one will be a database of sub-industries, processes, and associated natural capital dependencies with a series of fact sheets on ecosystem service variability. So it's going to look at 167 some industries and 48 ecosystem services to try to provide this better understanding in a first instance. And then um, next year as output two, it'll go on to a mapping of natural capital related risks. So essentially, once again, these dependencies and impacts and assessing how these risks can be quantified um, uh, for, uh, for financial institutions. Thank you. That's, that's uh, all we'll do on, on the, the ecosystem natural capital work. If we can go to the next slide, um, I would like to call 
on um, Jan Kramod from UBS to uh, give an introduction to this, which has become a very high profile program within our uh, uh, climate program. Climate stretches across all of our industries, but this one initially at least is specifically grouping together. Uh, right now, I believe it's 10 of our banking members to pilot the implementation of the Financial Stability Board's Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosure. Jan? Thanks, Eric, and hi, <clears throat> hi, hi everyone. Um, <clears throat> so I'm, I'm going to assume that most of you on this call are, are familiar, already familiar with the, uh, with the task force work. Um, but in a nutshell, for those who, who may not be, um, the, the task force was launched back in December 2015 by, by the, the FSB with the objective to improve climate-related financial disclosure for uh, essentially for consumption by financial markets <clears throat> and to ensure that there is a continued stability as we transition to a low carbon economy. Um, it, is, it, it was modeled after the, the success of the um, a, a formal initiative called the Enhanced Disclosure Task Force, which had been established by the FSB to improve financial risk disclosure by banks after the financial crisis. Um, and it is led by the two gentlemen on the picture, which was the previous slide, so that's that would be Mark Carney, the, um, the current chair of the FSB, and uh, who appointed Michael Bloomberg, who is chairing the uh, the task force. And actually, the final report will be launched tomorrow, I believe. There, there have been several drafts um, circulating. I'm sure you've seen them. Uh, but yeah, the final the final report will be launched tomorrow. So for banks, it is relevant in a way we prepare our own disclosure, obviously, uh, for consumption by um, you know our stakeholders, including regulators. But of course, it's all also um, uh, important as we are consumers or users of corporate disclosure in our, our own risk and investment decisions. Um, next, ne next slide, please. So this project is about, um, as Eric said, we're currently about 10, 10, 10 uh, participants in the project. It's, uh, it's about getting a group of in interested banks together to pilot some of the, the, uh, the task force recommendations. And, and really to try to address some of the challenges around um, a, a few of those recommendations where standards and methodologies might not yet exist. And here I'm thinking particularly about the scenarios and models that um, the task force is asking us to use to assess climate change risks, something that at least in the banking sector is still in its infancy. Um, so the group of banks will tap into our own collective wisdom um, amongst ourselves and work with external partners when lacking such wisdom. And the, the aim deliverable will be some kind of guidance and tools for um, helping banks align with the recommendations to pilot them. And, um, and crucially, I think that the, 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 the over kind of overarching objective of all this is to support harmonization of disclosure across the sector because it's going to be of no use if each bank and in each region have their own uh, way of interpreting the task force and then we don't have harmonized disclosure. Next slide, please. Um, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but this is just to remind you that in the task force uh, and others of you, um, climate change risk can be take the form of either transition or physical risk. Um, and we haven't taken a final decision on this, but we are likely to look at both set of risks in our project. Uh, so both the, the the risks related to, for example, regulations that um, governments have put into place to address climate change, as well as the actual physical risk we might be faced uh, as climate change happens. Uh, next slide, please. So in terms of burden sharing, uh, the sec the UNFPA secretariat has kindly agreed to to facilitate um, the group's discussion to also manage uh, any external partners we might uh, retain to help us and generally to help us navigate through existing methodologies. And the partici banks, parti pa sorry, participating banks themselves, they agreed to test approaches internally. So there's, there's gonna be some, some effort by, by ourselves to, to, um, to socialize the, um, the, um, the recommendation across functions that might be impacted, test them, pilot them, and then share the results with the rest of the group. Um, we will also fund any external spend to the height of, uh, at the moment we are we are looking at between 15 and $30,000 per, um, per participating bank. Uh, next slide, please. 
So the what are we expecting as a benefit? Um, I think firstly we want to be part of the solution and and really support and shape the emergence of what we think is much needed international standard in this in this area. Uh, we also hope to reduce the cost of compliance with uh, with the re recommendations by um, syndicating the resources needed to achieve it. Um, thirdly, we hope to benefit from each other's experience and from obviously external expertise to address our knowledge gaps. Um, and, and, and here again, I'm, I'm thinking of, of um, the whole area of um, scenario and models. Uh, fourthly, uh, we also will have a, a safe place to exchange and compare with it one another because, as we know, you know, benchmarking is always very important for us, uh, and also to ensure harmonisation. And finally, um, perhaps one of the more important ones uh, for for some of us, at least, we can position ourselves in the, as first movers in this space, and we know this is a space closely watched by many of our of our key stakeholders. Next slide, please. So where do we stand at the moment? We had uh, we've just really started. Uh, we had a couple of calls, and um, we've agreed to focus on um, you know uh, start set scenarios and models, and uh, pop, very likely some of the assessment and disclosure metrics that we need to deliver. Um, we have also agreed that we'll be looking at both a two degree scenario, but also at a business as usual scenario. We also agreed that we'll look initially at least at across sectors, so all of the sectors that we have in our, uh, to which we have exposure, uh, essentially all the economy, uh, and to look at the macroeconomic impact of climate change across those sectors, but then also uh, to be more, to be able to be more granular in, uh, in our analysis, we, we leave ourselves the option to also make a, a more bottom-up analysis looking into um, specific sectors that might be more exposed to climate change risks. Um, but all this is still very much early days, so uh, the project is still being shaped, and um, it might change uh, going going forward. Next slide, please. So in terms of next steps, uh, we intend to go public with a press release on the project in the next couple of weeks after the, re the release of the final recommendations. And um, I would like to encourage the broader UNIPFI member constituency and anyone on this call to um, to become active in this project in one way or another. So if you're interested, please contact Simons. You've got the contact uh, her contact her email address here on this slide, um, and um, and she will be happy to to give you more information on how you might um, you might be able to get more active on this. The project will run from now to April next year. Um, where we will be delivering the final case studies. And from then on, the objective will be that participating banks would then be equipped to start reporting against the recommendations uh, in the following reporting year. Um, so that's all for me. Uh, happy to take questions either now or um, at the end of the webinar as, um, as the Secretariat, Secretariat uh, decides. Thank you. Great, thanks very much, Anne. Unfortunately, um, we don't have time for detailed questions now. If anyone wants, they can put them in the chat box and at the end of the seminar, if we have time, um, we will um, uh, get to as many as we can. Otherwise, we will follow up afterwards. Uh, super, yeah, and this is a great project and we, have, um, uh, we, we are actually looking about whether something similar should be done for the other industries and that's actually in discussion now. So please give us your views if you're in um, insurance or investment side. Um, but now I, I will move on to the uh, uh, next topic, which is uh, investment. I'm going to talk about two specific projects underway. Um, one is uh, working related to fiduciary duty, and, and this is this ongoing program. It's been running for three years with the PRI and the Generation Foundation. We're halfway through it, which essentially builds on the report, the fiduciary duty in the 21st century. And the, the, the overall focus is how, how can we clarify fiduciary duties in relation to ESG integration um, into, including into regulatory and legal frameworks. There's a lot of interpretation um, that uh, is done in the application of fiduciary duties and therefore there's a lot of awareness raising that's required to help shift um, some of it, which will require some regulatory 
we say fixes or changes and some of which can be done um, already. Um, so what's been developed are roadmaps to help investors take a broader approach interpretation of the fiduciary duty. Um, as many of you will know, the term fiduciary duty is a common law concept essentially requiring fiduciaries to ask and act in the best interest of their, of their beneficiaries and clients. In civil law countries, fiduciary duties or their equivalent tend to include the notion of the duty of prudence and the duty of loyalty. Um, roadmaps for the US, Canada, UK, Japan, Australia, Brazil, and South Africa are already published. Germany will be launched in Frankfurt on the 13th of July, and China will be launched in December of this year. Um, each of these roadmaps is basically uh, sets of recommendations based on a um, series of interviews with key stakeholders uh, in each one of these countries. Um, and for each set of recommendations, we've prioritized interventions for the project to take forward in, in um, the rest of this year and next year. Um, for example, this month we held a private roundtable with Brazilian regulators to discuss regulatory action and industry compliance, investor stewardship and corporate reporting um, in Brazil. Uh, so there's a lot of activities going on. Uh, this project will also produce a global overview report on progress in 2018. Next slide, please. Uh, another example of the investment work is uh, the Sustainable Stock Exchanges Initiative. And this is a um, initiative co-hosted by UNIFFI, PRI, Global Compact, and UNCTAD. So it's a, a, um, uh, a group which has grown in terms of the stock exchanges to, I believe, 63 exchanges are now members. Uh, and one of their uh, big focus areas uh, this year has been on gender equality. Now that's SDG 5, for those keeping track. Um, and 5 is actually also the number in terms of percentage of CEOs who are women along, among large listed companies, and therefore an indication that a lot more needs to be done and there definitely is a role for, for stock exchanges in that. And you know, repeatedly studies have shown um, the, the, the issue of the, the need to empower women and that it's not only the right thing to do, but it's actually the right business thing to do. It, it makes good financial sense. Um, on March 8th of this year, 43 stock exchanges rang the bell globally uh, to launch this report on gender equality. And the report covers a legal review of gender equality measures in different jurisdictions um, and offers recommendations of the role that stock exchanges can take, both along the lines of leading by example and promoting gender equality uh, across the markets. Uh, it includes case studies uh, from the exchanges in Australia, Brazil, Egypt, Germany, uh, in Hong Kong, and in, in India. Um, so it's a great uh, example of a, I would say, a new actor within the financial system engaging on a range of ESG issues and focusing in on a topic like gender equality, I think, in a very concerted way. Uh, upcoming, uh, we will have shortly the launch of the Sustainable Stock Exchange's Green Finance Toolkit, which will start to show how exchanges, what role they're playing. For examples of Luxembourg, who, who launched recently their Green Exchange, um, and other exchanges, plans, and what's already in motion in terms of scaling up a little bit of the race to the top in terms of where new green business is going to be listed. All right, um, that's for it for investment. We will shift to insurance, and with that, I'd like to, to bring on the line uh, Olivia Fabry, who's program manager for the, for the uh, UNIFFI uh, PSI. Olivia? Um, hello everyone. So yes, there's uh, been a lot of developments and activities in the insurance arm of, uh, of the UNFSI in the last six months. So I will present uh, briefly three of the cutting edge projects that we've been very active on and then uh, leave the floor for James to also provide uh, more insight into one of our big priorities for the coming months. Next slide. Thank you. Um, so UN Environment through the PSI and uh, through the UN Environment Inquiry uh, convened uh, at the end of last year, in December 2016, insurance regulators and supervisors from um, all around the world to launch um, the Sustainable Insurance Forum for Supervisors, the SIF. So the SIF is a, a combination of the joint work of the PSI and the inquiry over the past few years including with the first ever international consultation on insurance policy, regulation, and supervision and sustainable development, which led to the 2015 insurance 
2030 Roundtable, co-hosted by UN Environment and Swiss Re, and which in turn uh, led to the uh, Global Report Insurance 2030. One of the key recommendations of, of the report, uh, Insurance 2030, was actually to create the SIF. And it's not really surprising, um, considering that the key role of insurance regulators in sustainable development is recognized, as well as embedded in Principle 3 of the PSI. So in 2016, the process of creating the SIF was guided by a core leadership group of insurance regulators. Uh, from Brazil, uh, France, the Netherlands, the Philippines, South Africa, the UK, and in the US from California and Washington. The inaugural CIF meeting that we had um, in December 2016, as mentioned, was co-hosted by UN Environment and the California Department for Insurance. And, um, and during the meeting, what was also approved was the CIF uh, 2017 work program, which will focus on disclosure, access to insurance, sustainable insurance roadmap, climate risk, um, disaster risk reduction, and capacity building for insurance regulators. So in our view, this is really a groundbreaking initiative. So the idea is to really uh, strengthen insurance regulators' understanding of, as well as response to, uh, sustainability challenge and opportunities uh, for the insurance uh, business. Um, we have the first CIF progress meeting that will actually be taking place later this week, on the 1st of July, uh, in Old Windsor in the UK. Right, moving on to the second initiative we would like to present today. Um, this is the world's first investor statement, which was launched on the 31st of May 2017, so not um, a couple of, of, of weeks ago, uh, in support of a World Notebook Day. Uh, over 50 investors, health system, pension funds, and insurers representing over 4 trillion US dollars in asset under management have signed the statement. The state statement is addressed to um, World Health Organization representative as well as national health minister. And the idea is to openly support stronger regulation around tobacco control. So this builds on um, Sustainable Development Goal SDG uh, Target 3, uh, to be more precise, Target 3A, which looks to strengthen the implementation of the WHO Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. So um, as, as just mentioned, so all those institutions have come together uh, to uh, lend their support to global actions against tobacco, to openly support tobacco control measures already taken by government, and to encourage any further action. The statement was led by a AMP Capital, AXA, Carpers, and SCORE, um, and it's a collaborative effort by uh, the Principle for Responsible Investment, the PRI, and the PSI. Um, what I would like to stress is that the statement will remain open for others to sign, uh, until the 27th of September this year. So if there is any interest in getting involved into this initiative, uh, please contact the Secretary and we'll be happy to discuss this further with you um, uh, if you are interested. Um, now moving on to another topic which is uh, of, uh, of um, high relevance uh, for, the, for the PSI, um, which is our work on, on cities, on insurance in cities. Um, so at the end of 2016, ECLE, uh, which is the uh, local governments for sustainability, um, in other words, it's also the leading global network of more than 1,500 cities, towns and regions. So ECLE signed the PSI uh, at the end of 2016 and then became a PSI supporting institution, which in other words means that the PSI and ECLE have joined forces to create the largest collaboration between the insurance industries and cities. Um, so the importance of cities in promoting economic, social, and environmental sustainability is highlighted again in the, uh, in the UN's 2030 SDGs. Um, cities are notably at the heart of SDG 11, uh, which talks about making cities including safer, resilient, and sustainable. Uh, and it's true that the global sustainable agenda requires significant change in the way cities are planned, designed, constructed, and managed, and the way urban community manage risks. So the PA PSI has already been working on cities, so um, there's been a number of, 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 uh, of relevant work uh, related to cities that had been carried out uh, in the past. Um, but uh, the work with ICLE uh, started uh, uh, this year with the first ever Ensuring Resilient and Sustainable Cities Summit on insurance industry city collaboration towards a resilient and sustainable urban future. And that uh, summit was a, a one-day event that um, took place 
uh, uh, actually as part of uh, ECLES 2017 uh, Congress. Um, and this summit took place in Bonn on the 5th of May uh, um, 2017. The summit was sponsored by founding PSI member uh, Munich Re and supported by other PSI signatories such as uh, uh, Allianz uh, Risk Management Solution, RMS, and um, as well as uh, at others, and uh, city mayors and officials from a clear global network. Um, so the main outcome of the summit, uh, um, which uh, came at the end of, of, of the discussions and all the different uh, panels and sessions, um, is actually uh, uh, what is called now uh, the Bonn Ambition. And the Bonn Ambition, is, the Bonn Ambition is really to, um, can be explained in, in three different goals. Um, and those three goals, the aim is to achieve them by June 2018, which is um, uh, very soon, uh, because this is when uh, ECLE hosts uh, its World Congress uh, in Montreal. And uh, so the idea is to implement those three goals, which is the first one is to create uh, insurance development goals for cities. So here the idea is for the PSI and ECLE to convert um, SDG 11 stated targets into insurance development goals for cities that would set the long-term global agenda for the insurance industry and cities. The second goal is to uh, develop city-level sustainable insurance roadmap. Uh, the roadmaps will drive strategic approaches and collaborative actions by insurers and local governments. Uh, this could be linked to the goals for city and would complement ongoing efforts to develop national sustainable insurance and finance roadmaps. And lastly, the third goal is to organize the first ever roundtable of insurance industry CEOs and city mayors. Uh, the roundtable would take place at the 2018 ECLE World Congress, and the idea is to really accelerate uh, global and local action. Um, the Congress is held every three years and assembles hundreds of local governments and key stakeholders. So uh, this is a great opportunity to set the course uh, for globalizing urban um, uh, sustainability. So before leaving the floor uh, to James, who will be uh, presenting uh, another one of the uh, key um, uh, projects we're currently uh, uh, looking into, I'd like to say that uh, if anyone is interested in, in, in to get more, to hear more, to get more involved uh, into these initiatives, uh, please uh, uh, do feel free to contact us and we'll be happy to, to discuss this uh, further with you. James? Thank you. Good morning. Thank you, Olivia. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, uh, my name is James. Um, I am uh, work for Allianz in Munich as ESG Lead Integration for our insurance at the group level. Um, I'm also a PSI board member and acting as co-lead on our, our ESG standard project, which has been active for about three to four months in anger. So if we can move to the next slide. Thank you. The project has really evolved out of a number of previous PSI projects before. So going back to 2009 with uh, uh, academic institutions in Temple, we launched the first ever global survey on understanding ESG risks in the insurance industry and underwriting. Over the last two years, uh, the International Finance Corporation, along with Munich Re, led uh, collaboration looking at ESG issues in construction and infrastructure and how they relate to surety bond underwriting, which is in effect a completion guarantees that the construction will be completed. What we found during that process is that obviously these ESG issues in infrastructure construction have more resonance across many lines of business in insurance, whether that's liability, property, others. And this was discussed in a market event which we hosted last year in Munich, where we actually featured a lot of uh, experts on the panel and agreed that we should actually look to extend this project and program across all lines of business for insurance and underwriting. So as previously said, we agreed this project would be one of the flagship ones for the PSI board and going forward 2017 and beyond. Um, I'm not going to really lecture you on what is ESG, um, but in the bottom left corner, there are some links to best practice examples in the sector, which are publicly available. But there are in many more insurers who are doing these things, but are just not in the public domain. So why are we focusing on this? Well, obviously reputation risk with the growing sophistication of NGOs and campaign groups. Naturally, there are a wide, wide range of international best practice and standards two which give us more um, 
concern are really sort of the Modern Slavery Act and the guiding principles on business human rights, because they, they do focus to a certain extent generically on business transactions, and it's rather gray, and this means um, we have doubts about how to comply. So the project will look at trying to firm up some of those areas. Also, the, the relationship of insurers, we share lots of risks um, on different clients, different projects. Um, there's an opportunity to streamline, improve the flow of information similar to how banking has already done. And naturally, there's always a good to have an economic incentive. And one of the things we're starting to tease out and see is that certain well-managed ESG risks, such as forced resettlement, can lead to reduction in business interruption claims, which can then have various positive impacts on other lines of business. So if you move on to the next slide, please. Thank you. So the, the approach for the project is really two key objectives. One, determine if the industry wants guidance and has an appetite for it. And secondly, to start to develop the guidance in 2018. We're doing this through three key strands. One is expert interviews where we hope to interview up to 100 really experienced, really knowledgeable insurance industry experts, underwriters, actuaries, and also uh, stakeholders in the insurance industry from outside it as well. What we're doing in that process is also getting uh, indications from participants who are willing to act as part of a technical advisory working group who can really delve into the detail uh, in 2018 to help us develop the standard. Secondly, we'll be doing an online survey facilitated by Westchester and UTS universities. And this will really allow us to engage via press, communications channels, and via the UNEP uh, network to a wide range of people who we haven't been able to reach. And of course, our usual market events do come along. We have one in Geneva, one in Princeton, the US, Tokyo, an African one next year. There should be lots of uh, interesting debates alongside the ESG and underwriting one to participate there. Um, so if we can move on to the next slide, please. Thank you. So the project team is growing. As I say, we've been mainly active for about three to four months. and We've expanded alongside Allianz to AXA, Generali, Munich Re, PSI Secretariat, and the three universities who have been involved in PSI projects previously. You can see in the bottom left the list of organizations who have currently been interviewed already or interviews are in progress of being set up and we're expanding this almost on a daily basis as people become interested. As I mentioned before, we are getting lots of interesting and very experienced insurance professionals to volunteer to help develop a standard. And you can see some of the examples in the right hand side with the, the quality of industry individuals we're getting and these are very open for participation so next slide please so what have we found so far well we've conducted 17 interviews we have another 20 lined up and in progress and as i said we hope to get up to about 100 every single interview has been positive on the need for developing more guidance or a framework for the insurance industry you can see in the middle box the sheer range of types of insurance professional we're talking to ranging from aviation marine cargo um, cyber cover trade credit absolutely everything you can think of and there are some certain key messages already becoming clear I think when you talk to the specific experienced underwriters, they, they have a real acute understanding of a difference between reputation risk screening, when you just worry about what you might be found out for, and ESG risk screening, which they align more with the ethics. You know, Should you be doing something anyway, irrespective of how much of a share of business, which is quite an interesting one. Naturally, commercial and pressures are increasingly cropping up, You know, pressure to meet certain targets, and also, one of the interesting aspects on some of these types of insurance business is that there's often a matter of hours to decide on the transaction. So ESG risk screening is extremely challenging. So the standardization of an approach will help, and it will also help with the relationship with brokers. Uh, but a large chunk of the commercial industrial insurance goes via the brokers. and they're also a barrier sometimes to the flow of information as the insurance or reinsurance company will not have a direct link to them. 
So it's not always just that there, there's an unwillingness to help. Many are, many are very engaged on the issue, um, but often it's a lack of awareness. And I think this is actually a real problem for the entire insurance industry, particularly when you get to the executive level, a lot of um, developing markets as well, that the, the knowledge of ESG issues really is not embedded in a lot of areas. And this is partly because perhaps uh, insurance hasn't been in the same spotlight as banking or investments and perhaps not in the financial crisis either. But the positive thing is that there's a real desire that um, underwriters want to screen the risks, they feel they should do, and that um, but making it simple, easy, and in a language they can understand being critical points. I think most interestingly, we are seeing these sort of uh, anecdotal stories come up that certain things like if you manage and mitigate forced pre-settlements, you can reduce claims and therefore potentially have a positive impact on the underwriting process. So next slide, please. So finally, a really a call to arms and an ask for your help as well. Um, we are very open. We have an open door policy to this entire project. It's meant to be a very wide and open consultation. So if your organization wishes to get involved, and we are talking to a number of other insurers and reinsurers about joining, you can join the project team, monthly project calls, really helping to shape the direction of the program and also uh, just engage more of your internal stakeholders. Um, if it's just you or you have an expert internally who you think should talk to us, again, please nominate them for an expert interview. Likewise, if you want to sit on the technical advisory group in developing the standard next year, people are very welcome. And of course, we'll be sending out the survey and list for the events for people to participate. So do help us, do join us. We're very interested in both insurance, banking, and uh, investment professionals because in many ways, the things we're underwriting do have project finance and do have investors. And with that, I'll hand back over to you guys. Great, super. Thanks very much, James. And um, I, we, we've completed now the, um, the the meteor part of the webinar, and I just have a series of, of uh, updates um, to, to round out the call. If I could go to the next slide. Uh, the first is that, um, as many of you will be aware, um, when we did the governance reform that was approved at the uh, Extraordinary General Meeting uh, last spring, um, the Global Steering Committee was split apart from the underlying governance bodies and moved to a direct elected by the membership approach. In the past, it was actually just the chairs of the underlying bodies but it's, it's a, a new structure to the Global Steering Committee. At that time, half of the positions on the steering committee were put up for election. Um, and now coming up to the end of this year, the other half will be up for election. These are uh, for three year terms. Um, they're for senior positions uh, within the membership organizations. We have people like Sakhar Nusbai, who is the CEO of Hermes Investment Management in the UK, um, uh, Christian Tiemann, board member at AXA um, in France, um, Archana Hingorani, who is uh, CEO of H uh, ILL and FS um, in India, um, who are elected and several others are elected in the first round. Um, now we're looking for some great candidates to run for election in this second round. On this slide, you see which positions are up for election. It's actually a number of banking positions and then um, positions and the numbering refers and you can look at the extranet to see the exact um, allocations of seats which are based on numbers of members in region industry groupings um, and then uh, the that's positions one three five and eight and then position nine is an open position for all the other smaller uh, industry regional groupings as listed um, the full uh, G the composition um, uh, is available on the extranet and there's also more information in terms of the process of self-nomination through to the election process. Uh, if anyone is considering um, uh, opportunities here, please feel free to get in touch with the Secretariat if you'd like to learn more and please work on getting some great individuals uh, running for election to help um, govern uh, this, this partnership. If we can move to the, the next 
Um, and at the highest level in our governance above the Global Steering Committee is the, the AGM, the Annual General Meeting of all members. And the dates are now set uh, for the 2017 AGM. And there will be the AGM by webinar, which, the, which is the advanced meeting, um, providing information on the issues to be voted on during the AGM. The date is the 3rd of October, and there will be two sessions to fit with different time zones, as you see on the slide. And this will also be circulated by uh, email and in the newsletters um, uh, in the coming period. Please do try to join one or other of those sessions. And then the AGM in person, which will be the 17th of October in Geneva as part of the European Regional Roundtable. Next slide. Uh, part of the changes with the governance reform has also been to move from having a global roundtable every two years and nothing in the off year in terms of large uh, meetings to now going every second year a global roundtable, but then in the interim year to have five regional roundtables. And 2017 is the first year that this is being done. And you see now that the dates and locations are set for all five of these regional roundtables. They will all take place between September and December of this year. And uh, we've had a, a, a great mobilization from the members um, in these regions to essentially move forward in, in setting up um, uh, these events. The agendas are right now being prepared, uh, and there are lots of opportunities, both on the agenda side, on the sponsorship side, um, to take part uh, and contribute to the success of these events. So please get in touch with your regional representative or your industry responsible um, if you have any interest um, and you would like to get involved if you are not already. And and uh, my last slide is that uh, there's been a lot of information today. As, as I'm sure you're aware, there are a lot of other things going on uh, within the, the UNIPFI. Uh, the best place as a starting point to see what's happening, I guess, is the website on an ongoing basis. But we do have an annual review that is available on the website, which gives a very nice um, uh, quick snapshot of all the different types of activities and some other types of news. In information, um, please uh, go to the website to download this this annual report, and please also provide us your feedback in terms of the types of communications information between this annual report, between the newsletters, and other updates you're receiving. Tell us if this is the type of stuff you need. What more can be done to improve the the awareness um, and the the communicating on the activities that were happening? I think as everyone is aware. One of the challenges with such a global partnership is there's a lot of great things happening and we're not always doing a good enough job of sharing it and getting all members to be aware of uh, what's, what's under development, where are the opportunities to engage and where are the things that are coming out that they can make use of. Uh, so with that, uh, we are actually right up to the hour. Um, unfortunately, um, we, we do not have time for questions. Uh, for those who have submitted any, please, or if you have other General questions, please do get in touch uh, with the Secretariat or you might also with the speakers who presented today. Uh, we come back to you, provide you uh, responses and basically improve the, wherever we can, the, the communications um, on most importantly, getting involved in these types of activities and making suggestions for what more can be done within the network to, to help move this space forward. With that, um, a, a big thank you to, to Jan uh, and James from UBS and Alliance, to Olivia from the PSI Secretariat, and for myself, to all, to all the participants in the webinar for today's session, and we look forward to continue working with you with the rest of the year ahead. Thank you.